question for Aaron. Um, the videos that you produced and the and the and the, um, the testing the questions are those behind a a a, um, a, a firewall of some sort? Where, who owns the intellectual property and how do you keep it safe? So the the videos that we created are just in a private Dropbox account, and so we just share links to our students. Um, and technically at Carlton, that is my intellectual property. Uh, the, the questions from the, the sapling questions, sapling owns those. Mm -hmm. But they are great in that they worked with us to change up some questions to, to fit with the way we were talking about concepts and if we were talking about things in a slightly different order, changing up some, some terminology and things like that. Thank you. Again, the two uh, tools that you use for homework for assignment. Uh, oh, that was sapling learning. And and the other one, the one was okay. one was right, um, one was oh, made and one was. So the textbook was through OpenStax. Open Stacks. Okay, thanks. And I have a question for sure. you. Uh, the forms that you used for the surveys were it like, uh, did you come up with the questions? Your team came up with the questions of the. Um, for the survey that you did with the UMass students uh, yep. to assess their what they liked or what they didn't like, what mm -hmm. they worked. Uh, how long was the was the survey? It was so it was basically three questions for each component. Oh, three questions. Yeah, okay. which is you know what did you think was effective specific to the video? What do you think was less effective? What would you what changes or improvements would you suggest? And then the same thing only for the um, blog and writing. Okay. Yeah, related to the OpenStax textbook, before you blended the course, were you using an open educational resource textbook? No. How do you feel about the differences between the paid textbook and the open educational resources one? I am excited for the summer to spend some time making some edits to try to, to get some new content into the OpenStax. Just, I think it's great, but just some of the terminology. We moved some modules around. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've realized now after going through it a couple times that you know, the textbook, they're supposed to be standalone modules, but they do refer to things, and so I need to clean it up a little bit to make sure the, the ordering. So moving from a paid textbook to an open one, was that an overall net positive for you, even with that? I think so. In, in the fact, you know, students spend less money. I'm not sure about if they were to you know, buy a used textbook and then resell that, that textbook. I'm not sure what their <laughs> loss is there. But they seem pretty excited when I say the net cost for the textbook and the homework service is $30. Um, so I think the combination was worked out for me. I, I like it. Thanks. So both for Aaron and Luke, there's this question of the way students react to videos that are done by the instructor yeah. and by somebody else. So Aaron, were all your videos by you or did you use anybody else's videos? And, and just to finish the, the, the question, I'm kind of amazed at the fact that students prefer my videos <laughs> to the videos that are done by other people who are actually competent and, and coherent <laughs> lecturers in that regard. And, and I think they think in their head that if I said it, it's going to be on the exam and if Paul Krugman <laughs> says it, they never need to know it. Um, that, that just baffles me uh, at, at, as to what's going on in, in that environment. To answer your question, we right now all the videos are our videos. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll pick up on that a little bit. Just anecdotally, uh, students seem to be fascinated by their professors, right? <laughs> There's, who are these weird beasts, and where do they come from, and what do they do when they're not in front of me telling me things I may or may not want to hear? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is a component. Like, there's a real, um, you know. It's a complex relationship that goes on between teacher and student, and they, you know, develop a lot of attachment, and then they react against it. And um, so, just you know, in their imaginations, I think those little things that you know, the odd aside that gives a, a glimpse into the personal life, the change in your voice when you've been talking too long with the sore throat, um, you know, they make a lot of these. So I think that is really a part of it, is just the, um, the that aspect of the relationship, and, and definitely the concern of what's going to be done with them. <laughs> and to follow up that question, Kara, you instead used, you didn't use professors, you didn't use people in your videos. Um, well, we do have people in our videos. Uh, <laughs> I'm a documentary filmmaker by training, so th that's why I came to UT to do the project. and. Um, 
in testing and doing all uh, research ahead of time, what we learned was that students actually, at least millennials, don't like being lectured to, and they don't necessarily trust people who they identify as authority figures. They, m they learn much more readily and much more, um, uh, well, more readily through peer-to-peer -peer, uh, interactions. So I have experts, I have professors who give the content, but I don't show their face. You only hear their voice, and we animate uh, a scene over the professor, and then we see the student talking. So that's the way that we've done it, and we've gotten terrific feedback uh, for that format. I actually have two questions for Aaron. Um, my first question is the videos that you posted, um, the quizzes, were they based on those videos? And my second question is, uh, you had reading the textbook at the top in your list, so did you do anything different to get them to read the textbook? And were the videos complementing the text, or were they based on just like important concepts? The, 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 the quizzes right now are most closely aligned with the textbook. What I would like to do, and I learned a, a couple things earlier this morning about how to embed questions in the quiz, and that's another thing I want to spend some time doing this summer. Because um, usually it was students would review the videos just mm -hmm. before uh, an, an exam or a, a bigger a quiz rather than homework, and so trying to get students to, to watch those videos mm -hmm. as well earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I loved the assessment data that you had. That was just fascinating. Did each of you come up with your own assessment tools and design your own questionnaire questions and things like that? Because assessment alone scares me, but coming up with with assessment tools yeah. that are going to be robust and useful even scares me more. <laughs> no, I was really scared about it, and that's why we used the the two. So the only data that I presented were that that you know, standardized. Uh, knowledge survey, um, and I, I'd love to hear from Luke about sure. yeah, questions, especially assessing videos, because that's something I'd love to do. Yeah, I mean, so with the uh, intro to comparative politics, that sort of plus minus delta model is used all the time, and, and um, the UMass uh, Center for Excellence in Teaching and Faculty Development uses a very similar model on their midterm uh, assessment program, as do some of the other schools. So that, that one's pretty well established. The, um, psych research team, it, that is a very new um, instrument, uh, you know, rubric, um, and just had the advantage of it was a department of psychologists who are very serious about their instrument development, um, and were able to recruit a professor of education whose sort of specialty is this trying to capture deep learning, um, and then me. So we kicked it around and it went through multiple iterations as we sort of you know, I think initially there were 14 dimensions and the coding was insane, and so we cut it to eight, and that was almost half as insane. Um, that was one thing that I didn't really get at, is that it was, a, it, it was and is a very labor-intensive um, way to approach student work, um, and uh, because it is sort of research-oriented, it doesn't even necessarily produce a grade at the end, um, so, you know, it's food for thought, it's not going to fit everyone, but I do think it is a really interesting way to approach student work. Um, and it was also, and this is, you know, don't tell because this complicates the reliability a little bit. The criteria are were produced in dialogue as we were assessing past final exams, and so we were sort of looking at the behaviors that were actually going on in them, and then trying to like tune the instrument to like catch some of the stuff that we hadn't come up with blank slate. Um, you know, so that's another just sort of step in the process. So you recommend starting with a, a tool that's generally available, perhaps from UMass Assessment Center, and then to, and then tweaking it because I mean I would say you know go to your own campus resources and, and find your local experts because they're going to be. What we have none. <laughs> sure, UMass is great. <laughs> <laughs> We did, uh, the Center for Teaching and Learning at the University yeah. of Texas has assessment specialists, so we worked with them to develop our instruments for assessing the video. Right, we have time. One quick question, and then we're going to need to wrap up. So you mentioned that, that there was no ethics center at the UT, and I'm wondering if that's, is that something you've seen elsewhere? 
as a, as a common thing, like in parallel with the writing center and teaching and learning um, center? Yeah, there are many universities that have ethics center. Uh, for example, Harvard has the Sacra Center for Ethics. Um, the Markelis uh, Ethics Center at Santa Clara University is another big one. So um, every year I end up going to uh, an ethics center director's summit where we have about 70 different colleges and universities represented. So it's not completely common, but it's not completely uncommon either. And being a large university, it, it's pretty glaringly absent at UT, to be honest. Yeah. These are all viewed as a, uh, a service to faculty? A service to faculty. Um, uh, often there are faculty fellows, uh, and then they there's they're also kind of advocates <coughs> to specific disciplines, because every Every discipline has a different set of ethical issues that they're wrestling with, whether it's you know biology, the sciences, uh, media, sports, etc. So yeah, it's a helpful way of um, of really curating resources for faculty to teach 